Great. So with that, let's jump into today's agenda. So for today's presentation, first and foremost, we're gonna start with what is Impala. Now I know we have some returning faces here with us, but we've got a lot of new folks joining. So we wanna be sure to level set and align to set the stage for the, the subsequent conversation. Then of course, the reason we're all here today, which is that I'm really excited to show you a sneak peek of our new exciting tool paths. And we'll run through four different examples of how to use it to support your work. And then last but not least, once we've actually gotten you excited, shown you what paths can do, we're gonna step through how you can get started using it once it's available. So we'll do a little bit of an executive summary to kick us off. First and foremost, Impala is a groundbreaking new platform that's transforming fundraising as we know it and providing actionable analysis and insightful data. Well, how do we know we're transforming fundraising? First of all, thousands of development professionals from over 40 states are already using Impala. And what are they using? First, they're using Impala Essentials. This is for folks who know this is like Candid Pro, but combined in one place and for free. It provides free access to search both 16 million people across the whole sector, as well as nearly 3 million profiles of every funder and nonprofit, seeing details like every grant given and received. The other tool fundraisers are also using on Impala is our ecosystems premium feature. This is a way to analyze any philanthropic landscape of funders and nonprofits anywhere across the country. So things like early childhood education in Ohio or arts and culture in Wisconsin and seeing all the funders and nonprofits who are operating in that space. And now, of course, we're excited to be launching our new relationship and prospect research product, PAS. This is the way to even further revolutionize your fundraising, generating more warm leads more efficiently. So before we get into the nitty gritty, I want to give um, a little bit of background about us at Impala. So like everything we do at Impala, we built PAS with input from the sector, specifically a focus group of the top fundraisers in the country across myriad sectors, including things like higher education and the arts. We asked them about their fundraising process, about their pain points and their hopes and dreams for what a new tool could really offer. And then we took all of that information and incorporated it into our development of PASS to make sure the platform is tailored to the sector. And for those focus group, from those focus group conversations, we learn some lessons. The first of all, it has to be a light lift. It has to be easy for folks to get started and easy to use once you're on the platform. And then the other piece, of course, is around accessibility and equality. Really, access to data is so important to, for your work. We know there are lots of barriers to that with a lot of platforms putting limitations and demanding a lot from you. So at Impala, we're doing things differently, and that's really how we're raising the bar for the whole sector. And not only do we work closely with the sector for every feature we roll out, but we also come from the sector ourselves. So me, I'm a former philanthropic advisor to funders across the country. And this is really, Impala is really a tool I wish I'd had in my work. I log in every day and I'm like, oh, this would have been great for my due diligence. It would have also been a great tool that I could have shared with my grantee partners. And then alongside me, my colleague David is a former philanthropy consultant and founder of his own nonprofit as well. So we bring all of that extensive experience to our work every day at Impala. We are real people here who are dedicated to improving the sector. And one of the ways we do that is to ensure that we're being responsive to your needs. We're sure to foster connections across the nonprofit community to ensure that you are getting the most out of the platform. So let's jump into a little bit of detail about how Impala works. So first of all, we take publicly available data. This is largely 990s from the IRS. We then clean and curate that information into insight-driven profiles. And these profiles serve as the backbone for Impala Essentials. Now, Impala Essentials is that thing that's like Candid Pro. We have a search of 16 million people and 3 million profiles of every funder and nonprofit with those things, details like grants given and received. In addition to that, we also have a list feature that is part of that Essentials product. And all of that is free and available for you right now. You could log in and access it whenever you want. And then in addition to Essentials, we have our Ecosystems Premium product, which is already available. That's the way to analyze any nonprofit sector anywhere across the country. 
And then of course we have Paths, which is coming soon. And that tool we specifically created for fundraisers. And those three things, uh, essentials, ecosystems, and paths are all part of what we consider a comprehensive fundraising toolkit on Impala. We also have other features like My Portfolio, which is specific to funders and is currently available, as well as other, other features that are coming along the pipeline, like a centralized grant portal. And all of this is part of our vision to create what we're calling a comprehensive giving network. But today, we're going to focus on the fundraising use case, so we'll really just be looking at essentials ecosystems, and paths. So let's take a look at a couple of those before we jump into the platform. So first for Impala Ecosystems, the first piece of building an ecosystem is to define your ecosystem. You can customize your parameters around things like cause or geography to generate funders to compare. So in this example, we could look at climate change in Boston or mental health in, Mount in Chicago and see all of the funders who are supporting that work and all the nonprofits who are doing that good work. And then the next step of that process is to then analyze for insights. So we take the ecosystem and use it to understand trends and analyze funders to prioritize, for example, the Gordon Foundation and the Alley Fund that we're comparing here. And once we've done that, we then take our last and third step, which is to turn insights into action. So we use that analysis to generate leads, then save them to lists and share insights with colleagues. And I want to stress Ecosystems is currently available. And if you fall under one of our existing partnerships with folks like Philanthropy Massachusetts, the Maine Philanthropy Center, the Grant Makers Council of Rhode Island, or the Jewish Funders Network, you get free access to Ecosystems. So be sure to join the thousands of nonprofits who are already using it in their work. And as you can see, Ecosystem helps you to build a high quality prospect list. And then PASS helps you connect with those funders. So let's jump into PASS a little bit. PASS, first of all, reveals how you and your team are connected to decision makers across the social impact sector. So first, you chart your goal, input the personal organization driving your outreach, and then who you want to be connected to. And then the next piece is to discover those real paths, explore connections you already have to find your ideal engagement path. And this is based off of publicly available data. Connections are specifically based around people details like employment or board membership, as well as based on grants information like funding given or received and funders who give to the same nonprofits. And then you can search within those results to find a particular person or organization that you want to connect through. And then finally, you make that connection. You can view emails and LinkedIn information to immediately take action and reach out directly. We'll have access to more than 3 million emails and LinkedIn details built right into PATHS. So with that, I want you to put on your you know, creative thinking cap for a moment. And let's imagine that me, Danielle Belanger, I'm a member of the development team at Samaritans, a mental health nonprofit based in Boston, Massachusetts. So we'll run through four examples of how paths can help make my work as a development professional a lighter lift. The first will be to act on my prospect list. So find a connection to a funder that is already on my prospect list, like the Boston Foundation. My next example will be to boost my prospect list. So identifying new potential supporters like the Smith Family Foundation using ecosystems and then seeing how I'm connected to them using paths. And then for our third example, shifting gears a little, we know a part of fundraising is having an engaged board. So we will next see how we can ease board recruitment to easily see how I connect to a potential new board member like Jeff Poulos. And last but not least with our fourth example, we'll look at cultivating individual donors by leveraging my network to get a warm lead to a high net worth individual like Peter Lynch. So now we're going to jump into the platform to step through each of these examples together and see some great strategies to boost fundraising using both the existing platform and this cool new fundraising tool Paths that was coming soon. And as a reminder, Paths is not live yet. So keep in mind that this is still very much a work in progress, but you're getting a peek behind the curtain at what we'll be releasing soon. So with that, I'm going to go to our staging site because it's still in development. And you might notice um, 
things are still getting updated as we go through. So let's first start on Impala.digital. So if you are going to log in to the platform, this is where you would go. You would come to Impala.digital and click log in to go into the platform and check out those Impala essentials. But as I said, we're gonna go to the staging site here, which I already have queued up for us. So when you log into Impala, you will land on that search page, which is the thing that's like Candid Pro, where you can search nearly 3 million profiles of funders and nonprofits and those 16 million people across the sector. To just give you a little bit of a sense of what a profile looks like, I'm going to show you Samaritan's profile. So we'll go up here. I'm logged in as Samaritan's. Click on that uh, drop down and click view profile to see my profile. We won't spend too much time here because me as a, a person at, at Samaritans, I know about my organization, yeah. but I just wanna give you a little bit of an orientation here. So when we land on the nonprofit profile, we see details like the organization's name, its mission statement. We see that we have 990s uh, uploaded through 2021 and that our data therefore on the financials and people sections is based off of that 2021 990. We could also see information like the website and digital real estate, like social media channels as well. So I want to take a quick minute to jump into the people section just to highlight a couple important pieces relevant to our conversation today. So when we come to the people section, we see all the executives, board members, and employees who have been a part of Samaritans. This is based off of both 990 information, information from the 990 that the organization has updated or self-reported information like me, Danielle Belanger, Director of Development at Samaritans. And I wanna just flag here, it's important to have this information up to date because it's what paths will draw on when it's searching your network. So be sure to come in and take a look at this and make sure the information is accurate so that the paths tool can draw on the most accurate picture of your network and get you the most relevant paths as part of your efforts. So with that, I wanna jump into our first example. And as a reminder, this first example is us taking a look at a funder who is on my prospect list already, the Boston Foundation. So I'm gonna go back here to the top, go to the search page and type in the Boston Foundation into the search bar. So here we are, we see the Boston Foundation at the top. And one thing I wanna mention here, we can see that check mark and you'll notice that across the platform. That means somebody from the Boston Foundation has come onto Impala and claimed their profile. So let's take the funder profile for a quick spin. So we land here and of course it has a similar look and feel as that nonprofit profile that we just looked at. We have those three sections, impact people and financials, but we also have two new sections here that are specific to grant makers. And for our evaluation purposes today, the funding section is the one that was most relevant to our efforts. So we'll start with the funding section and I'll highlight some data points that I think are most useful when doing this effort. So let's start with the average grantee reliance number. This is telling us that typically a grant from the Boston Foundation makes up 3% of their grantees annual operating budget. So it tells us something about their risk tolerance as a funder, as well as the type of organization they support and size of grant that they give. So I can extrapolate a little bit about their approach and understand if I fit into that strategy. The next piece I like to look at is both this multi-year grantees number as well as the years in portfolio. These two pieces of information tell us a really nice story about the potential longevity of relationship we could have with this funder. So in this instance, almost 60% of the foundation's grantees have received multiple years of support. And we can see that play out in more detail in this year's in portfolio graph down below. And so in this instance, we might want to prioritize this funder given the high likelihood of uh, potential multiple years of grants. And we can see how that would play out if we got that multiple, those multiple years of support. So we can see that median first year grant number and we can see that trajectory over time, how those grants would play out. Now I'm not gonna cover all of the visuals on this page, but I wanna scroll down just to highlight one more area of interest. So this is the grantee summary section. This is an aggregated list of all of the uh, nonprofits that the foundation has supported and how many grants they've given, how much money they've given over time. And if we want to dig into the individual grants, we can click into that grants given list here. Now we can see the Boston Foundation has been busy. They've give, given almost 
30,000 grants over, over time. And so we want to really narrow down this list. I don't want to browse a list of 30,000 individual grants. So let's start first and foremost with this ability to exclude DAF grants. So we can see that some of those grants are labeled here as being given through a donor advised fund. I want to not include those in the list. So I'm going to select that. Now my grants given list is down to 14,000. Still a lot, but a lot more manageable. Now we can see up here these grants by size and grants by year graphs. And these interact with this chart down below. So let's say I'm fundraising. My typical uh, grant request falls in the ten dollars to $25,000 range. So I'm going to select that bar from this uh, chart up here. We can see the list down below updated. And then I just want to see the most recent grants so I can select from the bar on the left as well. And now we're down to just 160 grants given. So now we can vet, browse this individual list of grants, see if we see peer nonprofits on this list that might uh, tell us that there's some alignment with the type of work I do and the type of grants that this foundation gives. So we can browse this list to see if we see peer organizations. And I'm seeing some exciting things on here. I'm seeing some organizations that are peer organizations to me. So I am that have validated that this is a foundation I wanna reach out to. So now I'm gonna go back up to the top here and call your attention to this icon up here. So this is an ability for us to now find a path to the Boston Foundation. So when I click this, we'll now be landing on our path feature for the first time. So we can see here a couple of things to orient you. We see Samaritans filled in here. It knows I'm connected to Samaritans, so the system automatically filled that in here. Then we can see, of course, we selected the Boston Foundation here. So they're put in as our point B. And as a reminder, we can see connections based off of grants, given and received, or grants in common, as well as people. So let's take a look at one of these paths just to orient ourselves a little bit more. So we can see here, Samaritans received nine grants from the Liberty Mutual Foundation, and then also gave six grants to the Boston Foundation. So this makes sense because the Boston Foundation is both a grant maker and a grant seeker. And we can see here is that they have some nice, uh, nice history between these organizations. But let's say we wanna just zero in on people who have paths between me and the Boston Foundation. I can now narrow down these 10,000 plus paths using this connections filter up here at the top. So we can see again, all those various ways that it charts paths. And I'm just gonna select for those that are specific to people. So I've selected these four and now the system will update and just show me paths based off of those four criteria. And we can see, we don't have any first degree connections but we do have a really nice second degree connection here. Let's click in to see what that looks like in more detail. So we can see here Samaritans retained as a board member, Stephen Moshe. Stephen Moshe also then served on the board with Keith Mahoney. Now I wanna flag something here for a second. We are, when we show you folks who served on the board together or worked together, we're only showing you those instances where folks had actual overlap in their board service or employment. We're not gonna just show you, you know, they both serve on the board at some point. You can very clearly see here that they both served on the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation from 2020 to 2021. And now we can see Keith who served on the board with Stephen, then it was also employed at the Boston Foundation. So now we have a nice path between us and the Boston Foundation through Stephen and Keith to get that warm introduction. So that was our first example of running through um, using a funder we had on our prospect list and seeing how we connected to them. Now let's move to example two, which is where we're going to generate a prospect list using ecosystems to find new funders and then find our paths to those funders. So let's go up here to the ecosystems tool to start on that process. And as a reminder, ecosystems is a way to analyze any nonprofit sector anywhere across the country. And for those who are, fall under one of our partnerships, this feature is totally free for you as part of those collaborations. And when you land on ecosystems, there are three options of how you can approach an ecosystem. The first is through landscape markers. Now this is things like cause area and geography. So arts in Boston to see all of the organizations doing that good work and supporting that work. 
The next is this funders framework here. And this is the place where you can really straightforward plug in your prospect list, have the system do some analysis for you. And last but not least, I like to call this framework the hidden gem on Impala because you could plug in peer organizations into this nonprofit framework and see all of the funders who have supported them as a way to generate new leads for you. So you could have pressed their 990s, you could have done it yourself manually, but you could also just have Impala do it in just a couple of clicks. So for our purposes today, we're going to get our feet wet with the landscape markers approach. So as a reminder, this is based off of geography and causes, and I at Samaritans am a Massachusetts-based organization doing work around mental health. So those are the criteria that I'm going to plug in today. And as I add those criteria, keep an eye on these numbers down here, which will grow and then adjust as I add more criteria. So to start, I'm gonna add a geography the state of Massachusetts. I could plug any combination of city, state, or county into this, uh, into this category. So I could look at all of New England or just a few cities in Massachusetts. So when we do that, we get 62,000 nonprofits and 21,000 funders. So let's add some more criteria to winnow this list down a little bit more. So we'll go ahead and click add a cause to add those in. And this cause area list is based off the IRS's NTEE codes. So we could browse this list to see if we could find where mental health is, or we could use the search bar at the top to type in mental health and have the system make some suggestions for me. So we can see here's the one I want, mental health care, and I can confirm that selection. And now you can see our numbers went out down a fair bit or about 400 nonprofits and about 2000 funders. If we wanted to add in keywords to narrow down things further, or if we didn't see an interest area covered in the cause list, we could use keywords to do that. And it will draw from the mission statement and organization name. I, but I'm happy with the way this is because I am doing mental health work in Massachusetts, so I'm not going to add in any keywords. I am going to, however, dig into some advanced criteria. Now, there's a lot of advanced criteria, so I won't go through all of them, but I will highlight just a couple that are relevant to our activities today. So the first is this add attribute, and this is particularly to see what funders that have these particular attributes associated with them. So it could be something like an organization as a community foundation, but the one that I wanna specifically focus on is this open for solicitation selection. So this is a question that folks answer on the 990, and it tells you that they have open grant cycles, that they aren't just invitation only. And they can also update that response when they're doing their onboarding. So if their grant requirements have changed, they can tell us and tell you. So we've now made this selection here. We're gonna confirm that selection. And now we can see our number of, fun of funders has dropped significantly. So now we're at about 450. And one last refinement I wanna do before I go ahead and define my ecosystem is this ability to include or exclude donor advised fund holders like Fidelity Charitable. So I don't wanna see those in my mix. I'm gonna turn that off and I can see the number went down by one. So now my ecosystem is ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and define it and see what's going on. So when I land here, this is the typical dashboard you would see for any of those three approaches. And we can see, for example, that $83 million is going to those 378 nonprofits across those 452 funders. So this is a nice high level big picture, but you're probably saying to me, Danielle, where do I build that prospect list you promised? <laughs> so to do that, we're going to navigate using the funding menu along the left. And we're going to focus on the grant distribution and the comparison section. So let's start with grant distribution. Now this might look a little familiar because we saw charts like this on the profile page. But now we're looking at it on a macro ecosystem level. So let's take a look here. We can see right off the bat, there's 2,600 individual grants that have been given to support this work. So again, just like before, I can winnow down by interacting with these charts up above. So again, making the same selection of what I'm targeting for my fundraising and also checking that box on recency as well. So now I went from 2,600 individual grants to just 130 grants to browse. So now I can look at this list see if I see any of my peer nonprofits on this list, and then add their funders to my prospect list. So I can see right off the bat, I know Behavioral Health Network does work like me. So I'm going to add the Shaw Foundation to my prospect list. So I click add to list. You can see I have some existing lists here, but I'm going to add a new list, calling it Samaritan's Prospects, and go ahead and confirm my addition of the Shaw Foundation. 
And now I can browse this list, list a little bit more. I see, for example, St. Stephen's Youth Program. I knew, know that they do work like me. So I can also add them to a list here. That list I just created appears. I can select it and confirm. And then one more I can see down here. Oh, Gosnold, I know their name very well. They do work like me down on Cape Cod. So I want to be sure to add the Tower Foundation to my prospect list as well, just like before. So now I've added three funders to my prospect list, but now I want to zoom out a little bit and see details about those funders who have given all these individual grants. So that's where the comparison section comes in. So we'll move to the comparison section now. And right off the bat, we can see some high level details at the top. So for example, we can see the Carmen Family Foundation. They've contributed the most to this ecosystem. So they're definitely somebody of interest. So I want to add them to my list to explore them further. So just like before, I can hover over and click that add to list option. And I can also see here this foundation, the Fidelity Foundation, has given a lot of grants to this area. So they're another one that I would want to investigate further and see if they might be a good fit. So just like before, I can hover over and add to list. But now let's get into the, like, the, the exciting part of this page, which is this comparison chart. So the system runs analysis on all these 452 funders we can sort and compare by any of these column headers here. If at any point you don't remember or understand what a term means, you can hover over and it will tell you a little description of what that data point is trying to convey. Now, there's a lot of data points that you can use and look at, but I like to uh, hone in on a couple. So the first I like to zero in on is this grantee change number here. So using a Liberty Mutual Foundation as an example, we can see that they have a plus 19 here. So that's telling us that they gave to 19 new grantees in this ecosystem. So it tells us, first of all, that they're active in their space. The space, they're not just giving to the same nonprofits, the same favorite organizations year after year. And it also probably indicates that you'll have a little bit of a warmer reception when you're submitting that unsolicited proposal. So I'm going to go ahead, add Liberty Mutual to my list, just like before, select from that list and continue on my journey. Now, the other data point I like to look at is called ecosystem focus. So let's use the Smith Family Foundation as an example. We can see here that they have, they have a 4.1% ecosystem focus. That means that they give 4.1% of their, their grants to this ecosystem that we are a part of. So they're one that I want to focus on and I wanna add them to my list to explore further. So I go ahead and do that process one last time. And now we've just used ecosystems to build out that prospect list of new funders. So now let's go up to lists and take a look at what that looks like. So we'll click into lists here. You can see I have a few lists here. There's no limit to the number of lists that you can create on the platform. And let's click in to see what that list looks like that we just built out. So when we land here, a couple of things you can notice, we can have a share option here. So what that means is we can come on Impala and collaborate with folks on building out this list. We can just select from the list of colleagues who are on Impala or select our entire team and confirm. They'll then get a message saying Danielle wants you to collaborate with her on this prospect list. They can come on, they can add items to this list. They can add comments to the list back and forth. And you can do a lot of your work right here together on the platform. The other piece I wanna mention is that once you've done all that, once you've built this out to your, your you know, satisfaction, you can click these three dots here and export it to a spreadsheet and integrate it into your usual workflow. And while you're in here, you can, for example, see a little bit more detail about these funders. So we click that show details and we can see the median grant amount for this Smith Family Foundation is $50,000. So that definitely meets my threshold for fundraising targets. So they're one I wanna try to find a path to. So I'm going to click these three dots over here on the right and click find path. Now, just like before, it knows I'm Samaritan. So we're landing with that as our point A and we, we selected the Smith Family Foundation as our point B. So now we are seeing here again, all of the paths like we had before. And we can actually use some of these criteria up here to winnow down from these 10,000 plus paths. So let's take a, a spin through these other filters here at the top. These are options that we can run for if we're doing a person to person path or an organization to person path. But in our instance, we're doing an organization to organization. So that's the one I wanna dig into a little bit more. 
So I can add criteria like minimum number of grants or a grant amount or even geography. But what's important to me at a de development professional at Samaritans is the recency of those grants given. So I am going to be sure that any grant that's included in this is uh, has a path of at least a 2021 grant. And then in addition to that, the other element that the system will also calculate around is looking at funders who gave to the same nonprofits. So I wanna set a threshold for that of at least 15 so that I know folks have a lot of nonprofits in common if that's how my path is running. So we can see up here at the top, we have two filters that we put in now. And we're gonna go ahead and apply those filters. So now what that's done is it's lifted this example of Eastern Bank up to the top. And that reminds me, in my professional life at Samaritans, we have a great relationship with Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation. So they're a great person to have as part of my path. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in Eastern Bank up here in the search bar. So I'll just see paths that include Eastern Bank as part of the journey. So now we've narrowed down to one first degree connection and then we can see many secondary degree connections that also includes them. Let's click in to see in more detail what the story between this Samaritans, Eastern Bank, and Smith Family Foundation is all about. So we can see Samaritans received two grants from Eastern Bank. We can click that show more button to see a little more information about those grants, when they were given, and how much. And we can also see here that Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation funded the same nonprofits as Smith Family Foundation. And if we again click that expand uh, option, we can see really a strong track record of grants in common between these two organizations. So this tells me that they're giving to similar organizations, they focus on similar issue areas. So they probably have cross paths and have a relationship to each other. So this is a strong path and I would then therefore be able to reach out to Eastern Bank and have them introduce me to the Smith Family Foundation contact. So that was our second example of generating a set of new funder prospects using ecosystems and then using paths to find our connection to them. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit to our third example of finding a new board member. So let's go ahead and create a new path up here. And this is the first time we're landing on that paths main page. So let's give a little bit of a walkthrough of what we're seeing. So we land here and Samaritans is automatically filled in because the system says, Danielle, I know you're connected to Samaritans. If you wanted to add in a different point A, you can simply click that X here and add in any person or organization you want to start your outreach. You can then plug in your point B here to search. And in our case, I'm put, putting in Jeff Poulos. I recently heard that he came into some free time and I know he's really well connected in the sector. So he'd be great to help with my fundraising. So I'm gonna go ahead and put Jeff Poulos in here as point B. And we can even see here what his history has been. So we can see not only has he had roles at Philanthropy Massachusetts, but he's also had a uh, board membership at Massachusetts Nonprofit Network. So I want to now find my connections to Jeff and see how I can get him on my board. So we'll click that find paths option here. So just like before, we're seeing all of our connections to Jeff. And for example, we can see Samaritans who received a grant from the Mabel Louise Riley Foundation also gave four grants to Plan 3 Massachusetts. So given that they've given a fair number of grants to Plan 3 Mass, that tells me that they probably have a contact there they could connect me to and introduce me to, to get me in the door with Jeff. So again, this is another way that we can use the tool to find a connection to now a person instead of an organization. So you can see with Jeff, maybe we want to write to him ourselves, reach out to him. We are working actively on adding more than 3 million contact details to this functionality, to this feature. It's not here yet because our development team is still working on it. So I, but I want to show you how it works. So we're going to jump into a little bit of the kind of blueprints of what our development team is working from to see this last example of finding how we connect ourselves to a wealthy donor. So let's jump to that final example here. And so here again, we're landing on kind of that pass homepage where we can put in an A and a B. We're going to start with A, with Jane Smith, our board member at Samaritans. She recently came to us and said, Danielle, I really want to be more helpful. Let me know how I can help with the fundraising and outreach efforts. So I put her in as my point A. And then as my point B, I know I want to connect to Peter Lynch. I know 
that he has his own family foundation he gives through, but I also understand that he is a generous philanthropist in his own right. So I'd love to generate an, a relationship with him and get an individual donation. So I've now added my point A and point B, two different people, and now I wanna find my path between the two of them. So just like before, we're generated a list that has an ability to filter by various degrees and connections. And, and we can see some nice results down here. Now, no direct connection, but we can see we have some nice first degree connections here. So to start, we can see Jane Smith was employed at the Cloud Foundation where Peter Lynch was retained as a board member. Now, we could run on that path, but I prefer, me, Danielle, development professional, prefer a people-based path. So I'm gonna look at this other path path where Jane worked with somebody who served on a board with Peter. So let's look at this and see what the story looks like. So we can see, for example, here that Jane Smith worked with Rick Jones at Main Cares for three years. And again, emphasizing here, this is only going to show you these examples when these folks had actual overlap at an organization. And then we can see Rick Jones also served on the board with Peter Lynch at City Scholars for four years. So we can see that this is a strong path and this is what we would want to have Jane act on. So we can click up here at the top to share this path with her. So she has a good frame of reference for how she's going to help us connect to Peter Lynch. Or let's say in our own right, we wanna reach out to Rick Jones or Peter Lynch. We can then click here on the email icon and start a new message to Peter to reach out to him and start a relationship. So that was our fourth and final example of running through how we can connect our network to a wealthy donor. So now I'm going to switch us, switch us back to some slides to close us out and then open it up for questions. So here we are jumping in. We're going to I just want to take a second because I know we just covered a lot. I showed you profiles, I showed you ecosystems and paths and how all of that can be incorporated into your fundraising efforts at every step of the way. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit to share how you can actually get going on Impala and on paths when it becomes available. Because as a reminder, what I was showing you was just a sneak preview of what's to come. So the first step of this process is to be sure to claim your profile on Impala. You can go to impala.digital. It takes just a couple minutes to get started, and then you can have access to all of those essential uh, products, as well as ecosystems if you fall under one of our partnerships. And then the next step is once Paths is live, you can choose the plan that you want. So you can customize which of Impala's tools you want access to, how many users, and how long of a contract. And then that third step is that the platform will automatically calculate for you your discount to meet you where you are. These are some of the discounts that you'll enjoy. First, a 15% off for all 501c3 nonprofits and 5% more for new emerging nonprofits. In addition to that, there will also be 20% off for network members and their grantees. So for example, I'm eligible as a nonprofit if one of my funders is a member of Philanthropy Massachusetts. And then on top of all of that, you get a 5% early bird discount if you've signed up for the wait list. If you haven't already, you can go ahead and do that and still benefit from that discount. And though not necessarily relevant to most of you on the call today, there will be other discounts built in for things like consultants and folks who are grant makers. I want to reassure you though, you don't have to worry about keeping track of all of these discounts. As long as you've claimed your profile on Impala, the system will automatically give you those discounts when you go to subscribe to Paths. And once you've made it through all of those, you're ready to find your next warm lead with access for everyone made simple. And once you've completed those steps, typically the price you can expect to see is a price point for Paths between $85 and $130 per month for a single user. So what's next? How can you activate your network and get the most out of it? First and foremost, of course, is, of course, is a reminder to sign up for that wait list. If you register, you get a notification when Paths is live, but with no commitment. And you also get that early bird discount of 5% off. And then as the next step, of course, be sure to claim your profile. That will ensure that the system gives you the discounts that you deserve. 
And if at any point in your process, you have questions either in onboarding or just on your journey on Impala, we encourage you to reach out to us at support at impala.digital. We are real people there who wanna answer your questions and make sure you're getting the most out of the platform. So now I wanna take a minute. I'm going to open up for questions in a second, but before I do that, I'm going to start with a few that I imagine have probably come to mind over the course of today's presentation. So first question, when can I access the platform and what about paths? So first and foremost, Impala Essentials and Ecosystems are available right now. And then of course, paths is coming out soon. So if you join that waitlist, you will get first access as well as that early bird discount. Next question. So a really important question I wanna answer here. Is Impala including the email connected with my account to paths as part of that paths contact information? I want to assure you that your information is safe and secure with us. Impala will never share your account information as part of paths contact details. And just as a second layer of assurance, we have separate sourcing that we are using for that. We source our paths emails through a third party that aggregates that information from publicly available sources. And next, I imagine some of you work with consultants or we might even have some consultants with us on the call today. So as a consultant, how can I use paths for my clients and use Impala for my clients? So consultants just need your permission to collaborate with you on the platform, and then they can get connected to you and any of, other, of their other clients who are on the platform. And there's no limit to the number of folks that they can get connected to, so they can get going and help as many of their clients on their Impala journey. And last but not least, what if I don't need pass for the whole year? Is there a monthly plan? I wanna uh, just highlight the choices you are. So you can choose to only pay for the months that you need, or you can opt in for an annual subscription for a slightly lower monthly fee. So with that, I want to open it up for questions and maybe my team has some questions that have come up through the chat that we might want to lift up and give voice to. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and open it up for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Danielle, um, for a great demo. We're already seeing uh, uh, questions that are coming uh, in the chat. Uh, the first question I'm seeing is, is there a Salesforce uh, interface or integration? The answer is not yet, but we are working on integrating uh, both paths and ecosystems and all the data that we have with several uh, CRMs and Salesforce will be one of them. I do encourage you to join the and the wait list to understand and to learn about these new updates that we're doing. Um, Shahad, I might also just jump in and let people know that something we really, really value is your feedback. So if you've seen anything today, you think, I wish it had this data point, but it doesn't. Or if after this or tomorrow or next week, you're hopping on Impala and trying to get on and you're encountering some issues or you just can't remember how Daniel got to that particular screen that looked really useful, just write to support at impala.digital and I'll just drop that again in the chat. I just want to emphasize we're real people. You're seeing about half of our team on the call right here. One of us will be answering your email. Um, we're always happy to pick up the phone and help you out. And we also run free trainings every two weeks, a little bit like office hours at, at college. Um, and on top of that, we have a ton of free materials on the website. So the goal is really, we want to be helpful. We want to be here for you. You're not just going to send something off into the void and never hear back from us. Um, so please do reach out. And the last thing I'll say is we love wish lists or, you know, I wish it had this kind of feature or this thing in my life is super annoying right now. Um, just as an example, lists, which Danielle showed you, that was because people like you in a webinar told us that was something they wish they had, and about a month later, we released it. So please feel free to reach out with that kind of feedback as well. I'm also seeing some uh, questions in the chat about more detailed training and the training videos. So we are in the process of releasing a new help center, which will include all of the uh, help videos and training on how to use it. We are also doing uh, every second week uh, what we call Impala Office Hours, which is basically a webinar which will probably be led by uh, Danielle or one of our other partnership directors in which you can come in, she will explain how to use Impala, not just paths, but also ecosystems and even the free versions. It's all there uh, and available to you completely for free. 
We also just got a, a question about the pricing in part. So Danielle did cover that, but I'm just going to drop it in the chat again as well. Basically, the reason we don't have a specific number is because we want paths to be super accessible. And so depending on whether you're a small emerging nonprofit or a larger nonprofit, the price will be a little bit different. And that's designed to be equitable and accessible. But basically what happens is you just log onto the platform and based on the data we have, we'll be able to assess and see what those discounts are. I did, however, put in a um, sort of a regular price range just so you can get a feel. The main thing is here is it's not a big nasty shock. You're not going to get a bill for thousands of dollars every month. It's very, very low. It's designed to be much cheaper than GuideStar Pro. Um, but the other thing I really want to emphasize is that's paths. All of the profiles, all of the search, so that's almost 3 million nonprofit and funder profiles, that's already free. You can conduct thousands of searches, have unlimited users there, and that's always going to be free. That for us is more of a an equity point. Um, we really believe that this data already belongs to nonprofits. It comes from their 990. And so it should be available to the sector as well. Um, I also see a very interesting question from Jill about donor advised funds and how we're going to address them. And I think it's a timely question. Uh, uh, I'll try to answer a short version, but we'll basically uh, have been in a process working with about 15 of the largest uh, donor advised fund sponsors. Uh, in the country, so community foundations and uh, national donor advice funds, things like that, to basically understand what we can build for them with the goal of bringing the donor advice fund holders in. At the same time, donor advanced fund holders asked us to create a profile on Impala and we are already allowing them to do so. So we're releasing it uh, together with PATHs and we already have information about donor advice funds of course, the information there is for them to decide on how transparent they are. So you might see that the donor advice fund just had that anonymous number, but some of our donor advice fund holders are willing to just put their name out there. And then you will see the same kind of information like you're seeing on a foundation, but on the donor advice fund, which is, as far as we know, the only place uh, today where you can get this type of information. At long term, the idea is to uh, collaborate with donor advice from sponsors to make this data available on a much, much bigger scale. And I see a question by Brad. We need to pay or sign up for the waitlist. So you don't need to pay for the waitlist, but you do need to sign up for the waitlist. And Simon will uh, share the uh, the link again, so you can sign uh, to it. A free version, you can just sign up immediately, go to impala.digital, and it will take you about 15 seconds to uh, get in, just get your own user, and that's it. Yeah, just on paths, we, we expect it will be released very soon, probably by the end of September, if not sooner. Um, but I just want to be very, very clear that signing up to that waitlist doesn't obligate you or commit you to anything. You're not going to be charged anything because of that, but it does guarantee that you're going to get that extra discount. So it's a good way to just make sure that if you let down the track, you do want to apply for paths or, or purchase it, at least you'll be getting the maximum discount possible. Any other questions we might have? And as people are thinking, and uh, I know both Danielle and Simon brought it up, Impala Essential. So I just came from another webinar and uh, several people that already use our free version Impala Essentials. Basically, we always say that it basically gives you whatever Candid Pro gives you, but completely for free. And uh, they told us it look, it's basically replaced a $4,000 subscription uh, that they use to pay Candid. So we really, really encourage all of you claim your profile, it's completely for free. Thousands of people, including people in foundations, are already using it. You have really nothing to lose. Uh, and the data is just there to look at, uh, waiting for every grant given, every grant received by every foundation. Um, so we welcome you to, to join the platform whenever, uh, whenever you want. I just want to take a minute. I know we cover a lot in today's session. And I know folks can sometimes feel a little overwhelmed. So I do want to like reassure that as was mentioned earlier, we're really here to help. So you reach out to us at support at impala.digital with any questions, check out the resources in our help desk, join one of those virtual office hours. We really want to make sure you can get the most out of the platform. We know we we did a, a little bit of a speed round today showing you everything Impala can do to get that prospect list going and act on it using paths. 
So we want to make sure that you can actually you know, take some things away from our conversation today and actually use them in your work. So really don't hesitate to reach out to us. We really want to make sure that you can use Impala and, and support your work. So I, I want to certainly folks can raise more questions, but it seemed like folks were uh, wrapping up with their uh, input and ideas. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up for today. And thank you all again for joining us. We're really excited to have been able to show you paths and to have you all spend an hour with us on this afternoon. Thanks again to everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks everyone.